And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother and a newcomer into the temple. Part of the... Part of the double-headed monster creating the doom that came to Astraeus, which we'll be getting into tonight. In the red corner, return making his return to the temple. The, <laughs> the man with the man with the the man with the worst raid and impression he here, um, Greg Lambert. Yes. And in the and in the other corner, making his debut in the temple, and com and coming in with probably a little bit too much sobriety. Don't worry, we'll fix that. The Mr. Let Me Be Frank, Franklin Mills. Yeah, it's funny that you introduce us that way because Franklin was an Olympic boxer, actually. I was an Olympic boxer, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and weirdly enough, I was a boxer. I fought in the Georgia State Olympics. I made it to the quarterfinals. Um, I was 30, and I was too old to do such a stupid thing. But anyway, now I make D&D books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had, I've had, well, you, you wouldn't be, the, you wouldn't be the first martial practitioner I've had, I, I've had on the show, and I've, nice. I've had, I've, um, I've had, some, I've had some people who've, who've done, who've done boxing, I've had some people who've, who've, um, who've done MMA in the show, um, I've nice. Had some, I've had some who do, who do kendo, I've had some SCA folks, although, um, I'll I tell you what it has in common with D and D. It teaches you just not to be afraid of anything. Just go for it. Um, there you go. Courage. And I've I've told my fair share of stories about the about the t about the times that I did amateur hockey, um, which is nice. a short which is a shorthand for for. I've told the story in the past, but it basically went. It basically came down to, hey monk, you see that guy with the puck over there? Yes, I do, sir. I don't want to fix that. Okay. <laughs> It was a little bit unfair when I, when at the time I was six two, I'm six six now, and you got a bunch of five foot nothings <laughs> all around. Well, I was like middleweight, so I was kind of a big dude for middleweight. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, I loved it the um the the there was a gentleman's agreement of once of once I start once I start getting momentum, get out of the way because I'm on, because I'm only stopping and unless, unless I hit something. Nice. Because there were a few people who thought they could try and who, they could try and block it, and they learned the hard way that wasn't a good idea. Probably not. <laughs> oh. But it, but whenever I bring that up, people say, "Why didn't you play football if you're going to be that physical?" Well, hockey. The, I just don't know what hockey is. Well, two reasons. One, I had no in, I had no interest in football or basketball because I kept getting hounded about that. And two, I like hockey fights. Hockey fights are the shit. In it, in almost any other sport, anytime a fight breaks out, everybody's trying to break it up, which is a bad idea. Hockey has it right. Let them get it out of their system and then punish them afterwards. Right. There you go. Because <laughs> if you break it up, they're gonna they're gonna be pissed off and they're gonna start it up all over again. You're gonna be repeating the process. <laughs> That's true. That's funny. I, I uh, Mildred, I bet you beat some ass in hockey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's there's the there are only two rules that I had. No hit no board no hitting um no hitting people while they're down on the boards. And do not touch the goalie. There you go. That's if you fair. Touch the, if you touch the goalie, every, the entire team has license to kill you. <laughs> yeah, we don't watch too much hockey, unfortunately. Um, I do watch Letter Kenny, and it's got some hockey players on it, right? <laughs> Letter Kenny is absolutely hilarious. And um, I'm in Minnesota, <laughs> so. so um, <laughs> I'm in Minnesota, and I've got plenty of friends up in Canada. So, so ho so hockey is de hockey is definitely b part part of the deal. Plus, um, I always I always get to laugh whenever my southern friends come up come up to my area during the winter. 
Oh my god, it's unreal. It's unreal. It's 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 illegally cold up there. <laughs> I was. <laughs> do you remember that polar vortex from a few years ago? Which was, one? The one where the one where it was officially too cold to live. Yeah, that's right. That's 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 Minnesota. It's like, like negative twenty. At all you're allowed to be. <laughs> negative twenty. Negative twenty. I can handle. It was negative sixty-five during that that's vortex. Insane. It That's got so, it got so bad that my boss emailed me and said just told everyone don't come in. Hey, no wonder people in Minnesota love D and D, right? I haven't been to the office in years. I don't even know what it's like anymore. <laughs> I well, I know what it's like because they sit because I'm still banned from the coffee machine because of that April Fool stunt. <laughs> oh my god! What did you do on April Fools? Yeah, that's something. I switched out the I switched out the regular coffee with decaf, the sugar uh -huh. with salt. The creamer with coconut milk, and the powdered creamer with flour. I bet those. I bet people were real mad. Mildred, insanely evil. What you've just—that is like chaotic evil. What you've done. Um. Uh, yeah. That's what. Ha that's what happens when you give a guy with a chocolate allergy a chocolate cake on his birthday. <laughs> they did that to you. That's one fucked. of one of the guy one of the guys did that to did that to me to fuck with me. That's wow. that's horrible. That's horrible. It is, and yeah, I prob I probably could have punched him or something, but he'd heal from that. Your revenge sounds appropriate. Well, you pro you've probably heard the old Klingon proverb that revenge is a dish best served cold. <laughs> yeah, we've heard that. <laughs> well, that's it's, funny. It's nothing but cold half the year. But I, and I look, I look at all the cold and all the snow when it comes down, and I just look, and I just go, "Hey, free ammo." <laughs> That's great. That but, is great. But getting, getting back, getting onto the rails. So, okay. <laughs> I, one of the traditions that I have is get is getting the origin story. Now, okay. I've already got Greg's origin story as far as how he got into the into the hobby. So. I kind of sure. need to get your. I kind of need to get yours, uh, Frank. Okay, so uh, I was a really sickly child, right? Um, and I had severe asthma, and I was a bubble boy twice, twice in my life, twice. Mm -hmm. And on uh, the second time, I was in middle school, and my mom's friend, this old dude named Charlie, he he bought me my first second edition book and brought it to me in the in the hospital. They put it through the little slot in the bubble. That I can, they were pumping like albuterol clouds into the bubble for me to breathe. And uh, how nerdy is that? First, like first of all, that's the most nerdy shit. I've said it out loud. That's the most nerdy thing anyone can ever be. Uh, breathing albuterol clouds and reading second edition D and D. But he brought me all these uh, Savage sort of Conan comics and a D and D book, and I fell in love with the book. And I didn't have anyone to play with, and. Um, but I, that didn't stop me. Like my whole thing was like I love to create characters and write, and it just didn't like the had just having the book like helped me create characters and just do my thing until so, like I met Greg, mm -hmm. and we started playing and freaking freshman year of high school, and uh, we did a Dragonlance thing first of all for a long time, and then mm -hmm. Greg wrote his own world, which is the beginnings of Iris. I was there <coughs> three thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna go that route, I suppose I should remind you of. I suppose I should bring up a bit of a dwarven joke that that's that's been that's been present here in the temple. Oh, lay it on us, lay it on us. I love dwarven jokes. Dwarves live under. Why? Why do you? Why do you suppose dwarves use axes, even though they like, even though they live underground? Oh, you gotta tell me. Tell me why is that? Elves live in trees. Oh, that's a good one. That's, that's brutal. Brutal. <laughs> yeah. So Greg was my dude, and, like, we played d, &D and, like, we, we got into it to the point where, like, it kind of might have interfered with our academic, like, uh, high school life because mm -hmm. we were just, like, that was the world. It was our escape, and we were nerds, and we felt cool when we got to play this game. And I think everybody listening to us probably has that kind of part of their own Yeah. Experience. 
So. Where we played on the bus to school, and <clears throat> at school, and in the hallway, and in the classroom. Oh, this is the nerdiest shit. Greg and I were on the debate team together. We were partners. We. This is how nerdy. We played D&D on the bus of a debate team trip. <laughs> like yeah. that's like a that's like a like mad libs of nerdness right okay but we did that shit it's true yeah that's yeah. true i played dnd i um yeah. i was cert i was certainly my fair share of nerd but i was also um an asshole were you, were you a bubble boy i was <laughs> i was not a bubble boy i uh i was just i was just i was just big i was just tall i was just the giant nerd because i was taller than everybody else I'm like five foot eight now, so like I'm the opposite. I was like a sickly bubble boy who became a boxer. Yeah, I'm kind of weird. I'm okay. six six. Nice. And <laughs> the the asshole thing is sim is simply because I <clears throat> I um I am an artist when it comes to practical jokes, as I kind as I kind of hinted at, and oh, it's, it sounds like <laughs> instead of um instead of getting in fights, I would come up with creative ways to. To mess with to mess with the bullies in the group, um, I think there there was there was the there was the one instance where um where the where um the not the um approved students were go, were because Texas Hold'em was big they were going to do a bit of a Texas Hold'em thing, um, I'm I I had the dealer replaced with somebody I knew. So that so that I could have the whole thing rigged and run away with the whole bank. Cool. <laughs> it, rigged it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, because he yeah because he was there and he was and he was basically card counting for me so that either myself or one or one of my other associates kept winning. That's dangerous. Oh. Uh, I mean, there, there's been that. There's the there's the whole thing of rigging the votes so they kept for the prom king and queen, so they kept tying. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, I me messing with messing with the messing with the baseball team by cha by changing all by changing all of the lockers, and those and these were those god awful combination lockers. Um, <laughs> that and me messing with a catcher by putting Vaseline in his glove. Gross. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Uh, Violet. <laughs> um. So what got you? Can I ask you what got you into gaming? Um, my mentor had got my mentor had gotten me into tabletop gaming because at an er at an early age I would eat up game books. Okay. And ju and just any just any book I could get my hands on, I was that guy who would go into a library or a bookstore, and I wouldn't leave until closing time. To the point where, with one library, they um, they ju they get he he had jokingly said, "You're in here so you're in here so much, I may as well get I may as well give you a set of key. I may, you may as well live here." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." Then a week later, <laughs> he gives me a spare set of keys and just says, "Don't burn the place down." <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and yeah, there were times where I would be where I would be in and out of the library for da for days on end. And obviously, when I moved out of that area, I gave him the keys back. But um, so what I, keeps you? But what keeps you playing D &D? Um, what keeps me play What keeps me playing yeah. is I love discovery. Okay, I love I love discovery, and I love and I love I love stories, and going w going with. There are some people who st who stick to one particular style, and that's all. And that's all that they do. I'm not that person. I go all I go all over the place. I I had it beaten into my head at a young age to expand my horizons. I just never stopped. Hey, applaud that. Applaud that. Um, plus, there's the whole time. There's there's been there's been moment like I said there's been moments where I've gone into libraries or bookstores and just and just read everything that I can, and because of the because of that I'd be taking notes from everything that I that I could think of, um, and in that same in that same in that same vein, um, I think that's I think that's why certain certain traditions that some people have didn't really didn't really stick with me like right. the idea, um, like the idea the idea the idea that um 
that I that I have to do. I have to I have to do some, I have to do a European hodgepodge of fantasy. It's not not that I don't like that idea. I just don't like the idea that I have to because of some mandate. Yeah, I like gatekeeping. I I feel you. Well, there that's why they uh I mean Dark Sun and Eberron and lots of different products. spell Nobody jammer. ever talks about Alquadim. And that is <laughs> a fucking tragedy. <laughs> Because we I, need more spell thieves, damn it! Spell thieves—that sounds relevant to my interests. I know nothing about it. <laughs> Alquadim was an, was a AD and D um, campaign setting that is basically D and D meets Arabian Nights. Oh, um, I'm, okay. I'm there for this. This sounds great. They wouldn't be able to do that today, but continue. Oh, there's some, there, there's a. I know that there's a couple people who are doing something close with with Five E, but that. But if I'm being honest, wizards can't wizards can't do it because it'd be something interesting. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't have a Starbucks. It does have a Starbucks. So it, it might have a Dunkin'. There might be a, <laughs> might be a Dunkin' Donuts. I got thrown I got thrown out of a Starbucks once. What? Because <laughs> because, the, because management was anal about about me getting the size name right, and oh, I was yeah. and I wasn't having it. Vente and Trente and all that. Yeah, That's then, pretty... then a few months later, it gets replaced with a tanning booth. That's <laughs> hilarious. Well, can I, can I ask you a question? Shoot. What drove you to be interested in Iris, Chronicles of Iris? Um, I've I think I've talked about this with with Greg with Greg the last time I had him on, but it has it has more to do with the do with the fact that when I set up the monastery. The goal that the goal that I had was to do everything that I can to highlight the people who are doing the real work when it comes to um, what D and D can actually do. Cool. Because I've I have said many times that the the best way to experience D and D is outside of D and D, quote unquote. Right. Get down in the trenches, right? And I am. I have I've always been a down in the trenches pers person. Um, I can tell. I can tell. Like when a lot of people when they t when they when they reminisce about TSR, a lot of people will bring up AD and D. Whereas I'm the weird guy who will bring up stuff like Boot Hill or Star Frontiers or um, Dragonlance Fifth Age. I like Dragonlance Fifth Age. I actually wrote my own rulebook for that because I didn't know there was anything official, but I did write a whole thing about that. Frank knows. Oh yeah, I we tr that. we tried to. I remember when Fifth Age came out and everyone hated it. Everyone I loved hated it. it. I loved that. Oh my god, the first Fifth Age book was like groundbreaking. The flame, the uh, dragons of summer fire, right. or the flame. Or yeah, yeah like, dragons oh. of summer flame. That one was good. Yes. And then the War of Souls trilogy. That I don't know. It was weird that they didn't have like magic or whatever. And I was like, eh, I don't know about that. But I went with it because mm -hmm. I wanted to play a draconian. Yeah. And that was possible, <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen I've seen some people have this attitude that you like this is this again goes back into that whole tradition for its own sake issue of do of um of you need to you need to have dice for it in order for it to be a role playing game and yet you can and yet you can do some very interesting stuff with um fifth age I think fifth I think fifth age much like ever much like um everway. Was a bit ahead of a bit ahead of its time. Sure. Because you look at you look at what Fifth Age was doing, and it's not that far removed from from certain more narrativist styles of games. And right. the, the same is definitely um, the case with Everway. Everway was massively influential. Right. And we've we've only ever been narrativist with our right. games. Uh, we're always story first. Mm -hmm. And we're not very, I mean, we're okay at rules crunching, like crunchy rules and like math and stuff like that. I mean, we made three new classes in our Iris book, but we've always been about war and story. And so that's kind of one of the challenges that I've experienced writing the Astrius mm -hmm. Sword and Sorcery campaign, because the expectation of Sword and Sorcery is not necessarily narrative like in the gaming world people are looking for kind of a sandbox adventure 
where you carve your own name for yourself in the world, and there's no narrative. You just kind of form your own adventure. It's like the OSR type of... Uh, You're thinking type. of hex crawls. Exactly. That's what they think of when they think of sword and sorcery. So it's been kind of challenging, but like, you know, my point is, if you actually go back and read the original Conan stories and comics, he was a superhero. He right. wasn't subjective to like hex crawls. Like, he would jump into a crowd of like 50 guys and kill all of them and like walk away unscathed. And then he like, he was like, a lot of the early Marvel comics were inspired and like based on Conan. The Barry Windsor Smith era. Yeah, exactly. Um, like when when Conan is brought up, I al I always I always find myself drawn to the um, John Buscema era of the comics. That's great. I want to encourage you to look into the Barry Windsor Smith era. Well, I'm I'm familiar I'm familiar with Windsor Smith's work because um, it was a, it was a little more true to the Robert E. Howard than than uh, John Buscema. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, and truth, and um, although truth be t truth be told, when it comes to when it comes to Robert E. Howard's characters, I think the one that was my favorite of them is is um Solomon Kane. But even okay. w even with that, there's with like with um sort with sword and sorcery, um. I think a lot. I think a lot of people look at sword and sorcery and the, and they think. Um, Conan, and that, and that's the beginning and end of it. But yeah. if I'm being honest, I feel that I feel that that is doing the genre a bit of a disservice to act to act as if this one character is the be all end all of it. Whereas he's, but he's definitely the flagship. There hasn't been there hasn't been a better sword and sorcery character other than probably Elric. Well, you, say. you can't forget about Edgar Rice Burroughs with the entire sword and planet genre. Sure. Yeah. yeah. What, like, yeah. Basically, sword and sorcery right. with only very light like sci-fi trappings. We wouldn't have Star Wars. Like, I feel like yeah. Star There's Wars... There's a lot that we wouldn't have without the Barsoom saga. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like, Up to and including right. Superman. Right. And Dune. Yeah. Dune probably comes from sword and planet. You Dune, know, a lot yeah. of that. It really does. Um, but that so we we really try to reach for that with our new book though. Like yeah. we like when it comes to character creation in our book, like we we really try to like push people to go for these over the top kind of heroic archetypes. Mm -hmm. And we've even provided a, a yeah. We've even with like when you start the book, there's actually five or six pre-made archetypes you could play. Yeah, yeah the characters start at level seven in this one, so it's yeah. you're starting out. As a legendary hero, you don't have to build up from the ground up. Like the entire realm knows who your name, they know what you've done, your deeds. Right. Like so, there's a lot of role playing opportunity there. You start an Elric short story, and he's already established in who he is. Or like a Conan story, he's been wandering forever. Like like, and so we wanted to have that kind of vibe. Like you you create a new character. You're you've been this like your character's been around for a little bit, and it's kind of tough. And that brings me to an interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you guys have you guys considered um, some sort some sort of life path system when it comes to when it comes to generating that background? Since you're talking about starting up where people already know who you are and on some level, it's well, basically you know it's like we have two options. So we have the pre-generated heroes that are part of the overall saga of Astrius. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, we have uh, King Kyradar and his brother Pinnigan, who are the two main characters. So it's almost like kind of like a road trip where they're going around collecting these heroes so they can de de defeat this one evil. Okay, so those are two characters you can choose from, and they're pre-generated. But uh, we also... There's five or six. Yeah, we, we emphasize that you don't have to do that if you don't want to play those characters. If you want to build your own backstory and your own history, you can roll your own level six or seven character, and then those people are going to just be NPCs that the DM can control and that influence the campaign. So there's like basically two paths you can take. We have a whole section in the book about like 
the party composition and what that means in the campaign. Okay, here's what happens if you have these two heroes. Here's what happens if you don't have them, if you don't have any of these, you know? So we kind of try to cover all of the different options. We also give enough backstory with each uh, new race and class that it's like enough inspiration for you to see where your character could fit in that you could create. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, we're, okay. we're pretty heavy in the back. The, yeah. We're pretty heavy in the like histories in our books. If yeah. you've looked at the first book, you you probably would see we're pretty damn heavy about histories. So um, our new yeah. book is not going to disappoint when it comes to that. Yeah, and um, since you since you listed Golden Axe in the thing, I'm pretty sure you hate gnomes as much as I do. We do. Yeah. I just played a gnome though, like for we had a long session, and like I kind of I played our Iris gnome, which is a very different gnome. Mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of fell in love with it, to be honest with you. But it just depends. You just it's all up to you as the character creator to make a a character that's compelling and. And so what's funny is, um, in Iris, there are 18 different races and lineages that you can choose from. But in Astrius, there's actually only four. There's only four races that you can choose from. If you, if you want to be a gnome or a dwarf or an elf, mm -hmm. those, those actually don't... They're not in this continent. Because um, Astrius was a realm that was dominated by these barbarians, like the... Cimmerian type of culture, but eventually some of their tribes became cursed, uh, kind of like in the movie Willow. You know, when uh, have you ever seen Willow? Yes, yeah, when the uh, Bavmorda, the the sorceress, is cursing, she turns all the, the soldiers into pigs, yeah, right? So we have kind of that concept, we have the Several tribes of barbarians that get cursed into like animalistic forms. She's our reader repulsive. Yeah, so there's only like four races you can play as in this campaign, which a lot of people might feel limited by, but we made sure to give them a lot of thematic abilities so that they complement each other. Like you kind of want to have a party with one of each of the four races so that it's well balanced. Now, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes to the set when it comes to the setting of um, Astrius, with the with the whole with would it be fair to would it be fair to say that this is a set this is a setting that kind of has the points of light philosophy that was hint that was hinted at back in the fourth edition days. Exactly. Exactly. So. You know, this might be a little bit of a longer explanation, uh, so I apologize. But, you know, sword and sorcery isn't necessarily about hex grids and stuff like that to us. It's a philosophy. It's an idea that civilization has decayed and has become decadent, and maybe it's fallen. And, and civilization is, like, not necessarily the ideal. What's left is barbaric. So what Astrius is... Uh, we have the remnants of civilizations that were once great, huge dynasties that are now decadent or they've fallen or become ruined. And so there are no major cities in this continent. All that's left are uh, ruins of these tribes that have become cursed. So the entire continent of Astrius is an open world that you can explore. And we have a lot of destinations that, and regions that you can go to. And if you go to a region, the whole region is actually broken up by hex grids. We do have maps for that. Uh, so the players can actually we enforce travel rules and wilderness travel. We have a lot of random wilderness encounters as well that you can utilize as the DM. But if you eventually find your way to a point of light, basically kind of a resting place or some kind of semblance of civilization, that's probably going to be a lot more savage than what you're used to. For example, you know, I'm just going to give a, this is kind of a spoiler, but uh, in Astrius, there's a cursed tribe who are basically like dinosaurs. They're almost like raptor yeah, folk. Yeah, velociraptor Yeah, folks. they're like lizard folk, and they're very primal, and they're driven by instinct. 
and they have an arena, like a like. Remember the classic Star Trek episode where he like Kirk is fighting that lizard guy. It's like dun, 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 dun. that's what yeah. they've got, and so they have like a arena that if you go to their city or town. You're, they're going to capture you. They're, they're capture you and throw you in the arena, and you have to fight for your freedom. So it's, it's like, a big part of the story. Actually. Yeah. So like stuff like that. Like you're not going to just wander into a medieval like folksy town that's like, hey, yeah, uh, come to the inn and have a drink with us. No, no, no. Uh, every every None of that. yeah, all of the civiliz like quote unquote civilizations in Asterius are not some place you really want to be unless you absolutely have to be. Mm -hmm. Now, with the as a bit of an as a bit of an aside, there's a small part of me that w that wishes you guys would have had the chance to to take a look at a mobile game called God of Blades, which unfortunately is isn't available anymore. Oh, um, yeah, I, don't, I like it's I don't know too much about it. No, yeah. Um, God of Blades was a was a project by an independent group called White Whale Games. That was their own little tribute to um, both both pulp and er and early progressive style music. Cool, like okay. like yes and King Crimson kind of vibe. Um, more King, more King Crimson. Um, I, um, Iron, some of Iron Butterfly, Hawkwind, yeah. um, which Hawkwind, might be yeah. was, like directly involved in. Can I just yeah. mention? Like we listen to so much seventies, sixties prog rock when we work on our books. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'd say like I'd say Earth could also it could also fit. I'd say, in fact, I'd say Earth would would really fit. Um, cool. Prob probably some probably some elements of the sword as well. Oh, I love the sword. Oh my yeah, god. Right. Um, we actually got a uh, not to mention, not to distract you, but um, there's a do metal band who's been pretty popular recently um called acid mammoth and they're you know they're kind of along the same line of the sword and yeah. they uh i messaged them i was like hey your your music is the shit dude can can we use it for our trailer for asterisk and they're like dude we used to play D D when we were teenagers yeah hell yeah go for it so mm -hmm. we actually have like one of their like songs in our trailer it's pretty badass yeah. like it has a real metal vibe yeah, please check out Aston Mammoth if you're listening to this right now. But um, the one of the um, one of, and grant granted it granted I'm not gonna say it's I'm not gonna say it's the best the best game out there, but just from its visuals and its mute and its music setup, um, it's certainly an interesting thing, especially since the the we the weapons that get utilized, known as the Swords of the Nameless King. Um, I have utilized frequently as magic items in my own in my own games since I played that, and I even kept a small album that had each of them. Since nice. the the weapons served as your every time you would quote unquote level up, you would unlock a new weapon, and each of those weapons had its own little story that th that would be told as well as its own ability. I like that incentive to level up there. That's cool. Yeah. Oh. But. What I did, what I did want to delve into a bit is the four is the four kingdoms. Sure. Let's, yeah, we'd love to play about our four kingdoms. Actually, just, uh, just the now obviously there's a lot of stuff that can be covered within just one kingdom, so we so it's one of those things where we'd have to go with the skinny. But yeah, what the, can yeah. let's start with the centurions of the everlasting sky. Sure. So, well, you know, in order to start with them, you actually have to go back to the past, right? So, basically, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, this continent was once uh, the realm of kind of the Cy the Cimmerians, the barbarians. They were conquerors and explorers who came to Astrius many centuries ago, and they were humans who kind of searched for treasure, and they dug under the hills for riches. Uh, and they were also, like, warriors who were masters of martial combat and stuff like that. Basically, Conan's type of people. And uh, they had a king. I won't get too much into that, because, you know, there's some backstory there. But eventually, the, uh, 
they delved too greedily and too deep. And they uncovered what they thought was a geode of gems and gold, which they would crack open and they would, hey, we found like an egg of some kind, maybe a dragon egg. So they cracked it open. And what they found was actually a goddess, some kind of goddess or god that was asleep within the egg, hibernating. And she awoke. And she was pissed that she was awoken from her slumber, so she cursed the entire realm uh, and basically turned the, the men that found her into these monsters called the Horde, who are these animalistic beasts that serve her slaveringly. Mm-hmm. So fast forward a bunch of years, uh, and uh, she was eventually defeated the first time, but when she was defeated some of the cursed tribes regained their sanity, basically. They regained their humanity a little bit. But there are still, like, these bestial creatures. So uh, one of them was the tribe who lived in the mountains. And they had palaces and temples that were built almost high in the clouds uh, where they could not be assaulted, you know, from the ground. And they became the eagles, and that was the, and they were the centurions of the everlasting sky, and so that's their tribe, and they believe themselves to be above everyone that lives on the ground. They kind of have this Roman type of slant to them, like a very decadent and and warrior like like Roman. We are the ultimate masters of law in this land. And anyone else lives underneath us because they can fly. You know, they're eagles. So anyone on the ground is going to just be beneath them. So that's uh, that's the one of the first races you can play. And they have their own uh, kind of city that's decaying. You know, they've survived this assault by the Sorceress Queen, but they're, they're cursed. And so their civilization is falling apart. And they're trying to hold on because it's kind of like the... It's a full and yeah, honor. it's the final days of the Roman Empire, basically, is what they represent. Which certainly makes certainly makes sense. Um, as a bit of an as a bit of an aside, um, a big reason why there's that why there's the criticism of civilization in Howard's work is his own, is his own experiences when the town that he was living in in Texas struck oil. Right. Yeah. Oh, but the next I wanted to cover is the Guardians of the Green Glade. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So another one of the cursed tribes of Astrius were kind of almost druidic. They were the opposite of the Centurions of the Sky. They weren't like Roman Centurions who were obsessed with conquering and you know inserting their dominion into the land. They were closer to nature and to delving into the secrets of magic that came from the earth. So they lived in uh, the jungle. They were basically like a jungle, kind of like an Aztec or maybe almost a little bit of like a Mayan type of uh, society in the deep southern lands of Astrius. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they, when they were cursed, um, their land became a giant huge festering like swamp and like bog that's like covered if you can imagine like Dagobah from Star Wars that's mm-hmm. what their land is like the Eleusian um, kingdom and they were cursed into the forms of amphibians so you know in D&D terms you know, people think of like the grung or the bullywugs mm-hmm. uh, they're kind of similar to that they're very frog like they cooler yeah, they're much cooler. We were inspired by Frog from Chrono Trigger, actually. So this is our... Out of all the races of Astrius, they're the most good aligned. They're trying with every ounce of their might to hang on to their humanity and the ideals of the, the past. They believe in, like, honor and justice and, like... But they can only do it for so long because their land is slowly being corrupted by this evil force and it's like their glade is sinking into the swamp slowly but surely and they have magic that can hold it at bay but only for so long so they're kind of like this doomed 
they're kind of a doomed kingdom that's like a point of light in this darkness. Mm -hmm. So third would be the warriors of the of the Roaring Horizon. Cool. Yeah, that's the Cimmerian Conan type people. Mm -hmm. Originally, they control the entire continent and all of these tribes came from them at one point you know they've obviously been cursed into different forms since then uh, but the these warriors they were called the atrathians and they were they had a lot of greek and greco-roman influence to them as well a little zelda too but... yeah, a lot of sword and sorcery stuff going on there sword and sandal almost mm -hmm. uh, and they were conquerors so when the Sorceress Queen, the ultimate villain of this, this realm, came about, uh, their king, King Kairos, rode forth. He had an axe called Throm, uh, and it was the one of the strongest artifacts in, in the history of Ares. You know, it's, it's up there. It's, it's like Excalibur almost. Yeah. So he rode forth and he slayed her. Uh, but he died in the process, and his axe was shattered. So many years later, she rose again. There's some circumstances surrounding that. Ten thousand years, I'm free. Yeah. So really? the Atrathians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. The Atrathians had to flee their home, and they uh, traveled far to the north, north of the north. So they now they dwell in like an ice-covered kind of island. That's like Hyperborea, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're at right now. And uh, the two main heroes of the story, which is the prince, the son of king, the original king, Kyradar, that's the prince, and his brother Pinnigan, who is a mage or a wizard. Those are the two main characters of the whole story. Uh, and their experiences trying to fight the Sorceress Queen and travel across Asterisk collecting heroes on their journey, you know, that's core, that's central to the entire Astrius saga. And you can actually play as them with a full backstory and everything uh, and influence, like, because uh, Prince Kyradar, he's a he's the king of this land, right? So if you play as him, you go around and people will bow before you. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of a different gameplay experience than a lot of people are used to. It it's going to require a lot of like role-playing prowess because you can command people to follow your lead or you can be like, I am King Kyradar. You will, you know, and you can just, uh, it's kind of, it's going to be awesome because you're like an epic hero right from the beginning. You know, you're not just a nobody. So that's kind of, that's where they come from. And, that brings me to something I, I always find kind of I always find kind of amusing. Um, there's the there's this idea that there's this idea that if that when you're playing a fantasy game you have to start out as the bottom of the barrel knaves by default, right? And yet, yeah. I'm when nobody. We, and yet when you when you look at when you look at the sort of sto the sort of stories that played that played massive inspiration to to fantasy storytelling as we know it, you don't see that all. The, you don't see that all that much. You tend to, you tend to see. Well, let's look. Let's look at the Greeks. Let's look at the Greco-Roman stories. Yeah, right, right. They tend. They tend to. They tend to be these larger than life ca characters, sometimes more literally than figuratively. Um, you look at the various mythos in India, and this is the case even further. <laughs> But the, and the same and the same thing the same thing applies with early early pulp characters like the like the Phantom or Doc Strange. Well, you're talking about the hero's journey, right? Well, not quite. Not, the hero's journey is more like the Hobbit. Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily the hero's journey. Okay. There's certain there's certain elements that dip into it, but I'd say. I'm more I'm more referring to the to um fairy to the storytelling motifs in fairy tales. Correct. He's talking about Achilles. He's talking right? about like yeah, like the but Achilles is a hero. He doesn't start as a farmhand who doesn't know hand-to-hand sure. -hand combat. He's already an undefeated champion, 
Okay. Right? Okay. So that's that's the kind of vibe that we're going for with Astrius as the classic sword and sorcery, like Conan becomes king by his own hand. Like right? the the first Conan story that Robert E. Howard wrote was King Conan. Elric is okay. at the beginning of the first Elric of Mel Nibonet's story. He's the most powerful sorcerer who ever lived. Okay, right? So that's kind of where we're going with this. Right. Like when you roll your character in Asterisk, if you take up one of these mantles, there's a lot to live up to, but there's also a lot to benefit from because you're, you're going to feel like you're stepping into the shoes of someone who like... Iris, you know, the Chronicles of Iris is more about the hero's journey. You yeah. start as like yeah. a, a lowly level one, like farm, per, like farm hand, or yeah. someone who lives in like a hamlet or a village, or like you know we have rat folk who are kind of like in red wall, you know, just very weak, mm -hmm. and then you build into heroism. But asterisk, you're starting out, you know, larger than life. So this is something, Greg, that I I, I admire about your writing too, and I'm, I'm just going to say this. So. Like, one of the complaints a lot of people have with 5th edition is that you start off, like, like it's kind of overpowered, and, like, you end up at these, like, almost superhero-type characters. But, it, like, so when we did Iris, you know, we, we kind of addressed that and, and made these characters. We actually have to fight to make your way up. And, and Asterisk, like, I feel like we've leaned into it. And I feel like that's kind of cool what Greg's done, is he's made this world now that's, like... You gotta lean like you're leaning into this fact that you're creating these characters that are just fucking badasses from the start. Yeah, and like it's, I don't know, it's it's, it's just kind of it's, it's a not like it's not like yeah. I'm one to talk when it comes to that because I've gone on record as say, as saying that two of my two of my favorite fantasy adjacent um, role playing games are uh -huh. Legend of the Five Rings and Exalted. Yep, I know about those. We used to play Exalted back in the Gamers Association. Back then, we thought it was kind of like we were trying to play like Dragon Ball Z almost from it. Um, that was a if I'm be if I'm being honest, the over the topness with Exalted isn't too far removed from the over the topness that you that you see in in um a lot of a lot of say the Hindu Vedas or a lot or the yeah. or the story of Arjuna. Uh -huh. I, I hear you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's just a different kind of fantasy, really. It's mm -hmm. it's like it's like Greg said, it's Achilles. You know, it's yeah, but like, it's Odysseus in a way. It's like, but you know, it's I, I was complaining about this on a forum um, last week when somebody asked, "Well, I, this doesn't seem like sword and sorcery to me. What well, what do you mean by this?" And someone was trying to question us about it. A little bit on the inworld dot uh, org forums, and I was like, "Well, you know, people have this expectation of what sword and sorcery quote gameplay is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they think it's supposed to be super gritty, with a lot of character death. Like you know, your character can die in one hit, and everything's really you know kind of slow, like the dungeon crawl, the OSR mindset, which I I appreciate a lot. You know, there's a lot to that." But sword and sorcery is is actually the opposite. Like it, the characters were larger than life. They were next to invincible heroes. Right. They almost never failed. They never died. Like Conan himself fought demons. He fought death himself. There's a story where he punched a shark and killed it. Yeah, he punched like, a shark. He fought like Cthulhu, single-handedly fought Cthulhu, and I killed him. Like, you know, there's, like, <laughs> like, Sword and Sorcery is filled with those type of heroes. So, like, the expectation that some people have of, like, the Sword and Sorcery gameplay doesn't actually... Now, I get it. Now, Fawford and the Grey Mauser, those stories are a little bit different. Like, Linkmar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a big inspiration for early D&D &D and, like, first edition D&D. &D. Those are more down to earth, you know. You're you're just kind of a rogue or a thief type, like warrior trying to scrounge for riches and like a, a decadent and like crime ridden city with like scoundrels and stuff like that. Now I get that, uh, but there is a whole other side to sword and sorcery that people don't realize. Yeah, and if I if I can use a bit of a video game parallel when it when it comes to this kind of thing, consider. The, consider a certain consider a certain character who's helped re who's helped revitalize a, st a style of play 
that is as far as far removed from that struggle to survive you make you get dropped in a hit as you can get let's talk about do let's talk about the doom slayer <laughs> uh, yeah yeah doom slayer is perfect yeah and you look at you look at how it's played you look at some um, the uh, the approach that's been, that's been presented in both 2016 and doom eternal you look at the lore when when the demons are describing the doom slayer and how terrified they are of this of this force of nature that just wants nothing more than to exterminate every single demon that exists yeah <laughs> to the point the where they had to they had to trick him into drop they had to trick him by dropping a mountain on him to try and to try and kill him and all that they could do at best was just seal him I mean, to me, Doom is the original Doom is a true OSR game. If you want to make the comparison to like the old school Renaissance, it's Doom because you're a badass going through killing demons, and you get beaten up and you get bloodied, but it's your own skill that puts you out on top in the end. That's a good point. I love Doom, but uh, Doom is the shit. You're definitely right on on that point. But to be to be fair to be fair to be fair to be fair to be fair, to be fair. <laughs> and uh, we actually so to kind of placate the uh, the people who think that there should be a certain method of playing like a sword and sorcery campaign, uh, we do have a chapter of optional rules in the Doom and Astrius to kind of bring it closer to the old school. Uh, for example, resurrection is not possible. Uh, if your character dies, your soul becomes corrupted by the curse of this land. You cannot be resurrected. You are permanently dead. Now, that's one one rule that we put in to make it a little bit grittier. We've got some other things in there like uh, real-time keeping. Mm -hmm. So in Astrius, the Sorceress Queen has returned. I've mentioned her a few times. She has the army of the Orc, which are the monstrous creatures that she transformed out of the soldiers that found her. And they're populating, like they're growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. So basically, this marauding horde is taking over the entire continent, square by square. Hex by hex. Yeah, hex by hex. The, the DM will populate a region with a couple of legions of horde every single day. And when we say every day, we mean like the, the DM is keeping track of time in real time. So during downtime, if the players aren't playing, three or four days pass, three or four more regions become occupied the, by the horde. Mm -hmm. So if the players aren't fast enough, and if they're not on track to defeat the Sorcerer's Queen, Eventually, the entire realm will be overrun by these ravaging marauders, and they'll be cornered. They'll have no option but but to be defeated. Mm -hmm. So that's one one way we have like to kind of not necessarily keep it on rails, but to add a sense of urgency and danger to the campaign. Yeah. Now, I can I kind of got I kind of got caught up on things. I I just realized that if that there was one. Um, kingdom that I forgot to touch on. Oh yeah, yeah, that's and right. That being the tribes of the wasteland. That's right, the Sliskvir. They're my favorite. Yeah, I love them too. So, uh, just a quick side note: this is a war thing, but all of our kind of non-human races follow a similar naming convention. You know, on Iris, the rats were the Radavir, mm -hmm. and the dragons were the Drakenvir, which is kind of like the same etymology as like werewolf you know where means man wolf means wolf so it's like a wolf man so veer means man in this so it's like dra dragon man or rat man that's basically where it comes from mm -hmm. so the slis the slisk veer are the lizard men basically the old the ultimate sword and sorcery like villain basically very barbaric but these are more like raptors from my goal was, like, I told our artist, okay, here's what I want. I want the raptor from Jurassic Park. I want that to be a 
sword and sorcery warrior. Can you do that for me? And he's like, okay. So that's that's where mm-hmm. we came from. Like that race are vicious. Their racial ability is like they can charge and slash somebody with their raptor claw and get like critical hit on like a nineteen or above. Oh, they're fucking bad. Yeah. So they're they're all about like instinct and bloodlust and bloodthirst. But you got to play with the reptilian mindset too. They're yeah. not human. Anymore. They're not. They have some aspect of their humanity of course still you know within them but they're just they're dominated by these bestial instincts and that's one that leads me to one thing i wanted to point out like the races in astrius represent alignments so we actually enforce that uh which is kind of unusual for fifth edition because everything is left open to interpretation, but in Astrius, for example, the Centurions of the Everlasting Sky, they represent law, right? Because they they believe themselves to be the ultimate force of law and order in the entire realm. So a character there is going to have law at the core of their personality, whereas the Sliskvir, the Raptors, are chaos, right? They're dominated by bloodlust and instinct. So they're going to have a chaotic disposition at the core of their personality. And the frogs are good, and the humans are neutral, the horg are evil. So we, we kind of have these archetypical ideas of what each race is supposed to represent. You can break away from that, of course. You know, we can't stop you from making any character that you want. But we definitely encourage, if you want to make a specific type of character, this is the race you want to choose, and these are the reasons why. Well, that's, that's Sword and Sorcery, like, to a T, though. Yeah. I mean, Sword and Sorcery is often associated with, like, moral gray areas. Like, you, know, you don't necessarily know. But the heroes are not, like, sh- knights in shining armor. They're doing things for their own selfish reasons, for the most part. Right. And that's our humans. That's the Atrathians. They're neutral. Yeah. The barbarians want to save the realm, obviously. They want to defeat the Sorceress Queen, but it's not because they feel heartfelt sorrow for the plight of the people. It's because they want vengeance. Right. right? They, they want vengeance against her because of what she's done to their kingdom, and they want eternal glory for go. themselves, you know? So it's like they have kind of a neutral mindset in that regard. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. I think this whole idea of alignment going away in, like, modern role-playing is weird to me. I mean, it's... I've, yeah. I've been of the opinion that alignment uh, alignment as it, as it was presented uh-huh. is a decent idea that was pushed into a direction that it was never designed for. Right, okay, I agree with you. I agree with you there. Uh, yeah. There was alignment language at one point, which I don't know what you know what that is, Frank. I don't know. But back in the old days, there was actually a hidden language that was kind of like gestures and like a manner of speaking that other people of your alignment would immediately recognize you as being part of. It's weird. Yeah, it's, it's, it is really weird. It's like very hard to translate into like a modern game, but like that was a big deal back in the day. Like you had alignment language and you could kind of like you could role play in a way where other people would know that you were lawful mm-hmm. and or they would know that you were chaotic. Like it was like a weird thing. Um So my the, point is, is when we oh, write, go ahead. What was that? When we write these stories, we're not writing hyper realism and like the whole idea of alignment goes to these I to build from that like you're not stuck with them. Yeah. I personally believe in believability more than realism, but that's a, that's a whole other matter. Um, I think the reason alignment has such a bad reputation is because of certain archetypes that have al- that have alignment as tied into their forced behavior. The big example of this kind of thing is, of course, paladins, who have a rules mandated reason to be a dick. <laughs> I agree. Makes sense to me, though. Yeah. And, like, in, uh, that brings up, you know, the Dragonborn of 3rd Edition. I don't know if you remember those rules at all. Do you remember that? 
Dragonborn weren't in Core 3rd Edition. Well, they were in either 3.5 or 3rd Edition. I think they were 2.5. Basically... There were, there were half Dragon templates, but the Dragonborn as a full-on race didn't really start happening until 4th. Uh, well, okay. what, they were, what they were were the Dragonborn originally were people that could basically were drawn to the oath of this uh, Silver Dragon... And they would be transformed into a weird, like, dragon creature. And they would actually have to, like, be reborn from an egg. I think that's in, like, a... It's in Races of the Dragon. It's, like, a third edition supplement. Yeah, that's what. That's why I said core. That's why I said core. Yeah, yeah. So it's not core. Not core by any means. Mm -hmm. But what I was getting at was that they would... If they broke their alignment, like, they had to be lawful good. They had to be. Lawful good, and if they broke their alignment, they would revert back to what they were before, and they would lose all their powers. Mm. Which, <laughs> which I thought was a little bit like, Ugh, that's uh, you don't want to do that. First of all, it's a little weird to be reborn from an egg. People are like, well, that's weird. But then you lose all of your powers if you do something that's not like lawful. That's not cool. Yeah. And so we kind of reverted away from that for our dragon characters and uh and Iris were totally opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Um and as far as far as the whole re as far as the whole reborn in an egg thing, well, I've seen weirder things in mythology. <laughs> yeah, there have been weirder things. But, no, I I go ahead. How badass were the paladins of Warcraft too? Uh, <laughs> Well, that's because work. That's because Warcraft two. Warcraft two wasn't dr wasn't drawing up wasn't drawing upon traditions that it didn't need to. Right, right. Um, but they were still they were still badass. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. They were awesome. I'm a. <laughs> but the the um thing the thing is the thing when it comes when it comes to the whole. I've always I've always utilized alignment as more of a faction system personally. Right. Um, yeah. It makes sense. In part in part because in part because I had a soft because one of my favorite movies at a young age was The Warriors. Um yeah, <laughs> which Warriors. I know I know Maybe. that might sound like a a weird um weird parallel to draw from, but that's how it was. Um It's not. I don't know, it makes sense to me. Because there were the different games, and they were yeah. all different. That had like different themes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But words of the water flock together, right? When I when I had talked when I had talked with Greg about about Chronicles, he did mention that there were a few that there were a few new cla a few new classes and a few new play styles that were being added into the mix. I'm oh, yeah. curious yeah. if something similar is happening with um with Astraeus as well. No, we don't have any new classes here. I mean, we've got the three ones from Iris that you can be. It's just, you know, I, th I felt like new classes would be too much because, I mean, the classes that are in place are already perfect for the setting. You've got Barbarian. You've got Rogue. You've got Monk. You know, everything everything you want to be is there. So, I don't, you know, it's just kind of unnecessary to do anything like that, I think, for kind of a pull. Before we went live, you I do recall you mentioning some mechanics being added in that um are go that are going to modify how things might work with um casters. And I'm curious I'm curious what that's going to entail. Yeah, so um, that's actually from our first book, from our Chronicles of Iris. So a lot of people complain that casters are overpowered compared to Marshall in fifth edition, which mm -hmm. There's arguments for and against, you know, it's kind of a back and forth thing. But in Iris, we had a chapter on uh, ether. So ether in our world is an invisible miasma that empowers magic. So without the presence of ether, spellcasters can't cast any spells. So that's magic users are actually fairly rare in Iris as a result of this. You, know, you have to go through like a lot of personal study and like uh, and training in order to 
identify the presence of ether and use it in the service of, of casting spells. So we have rules in the book that say if ether is not in this area, you cannot cast spells, or if it's there, you must actually search for it. It's, it's an action called ether tuning that all spellcasters have. You have to yep. find the presence of ether before you can do anything at all. And once you find it, then you're limited in the number of spells you can cast by how much ether is in your vicinity. So if you're in a dungeon, there might not be much. You might only be able to cast a few spells before the ether is gone. You can't do anything. So, you know, that's it's pretty restrictive if you if you're the dungeon master and you implement that rule. Um, you can make it where ether is infinite. If you're outside in the plains and the forest, you know, not a problem. But if you're delving into a dungeon, ether might be very limited. And if you're a spellcaster, then you're going to run into some limitations. You have to be strategic about what what you want to cast and when. Mm. So we're going to, we're going to reiterate those rules in Astrius. I mean, Astrius is part of Iris, you know, the overall world. So the same rules are going to apply. It is an optional rule, but for anyone who feels like sword and sorcery is, should be more low magic not have as much magical power flying around, that's a good way to try and limit that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with, that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'll, when, it comes to, when, it comes to sword, when it comes to sword and sorcery, um, I, always, I always find myself calling back to some of the, some of the more interesting weapons that you have that you have when you don't have a ready a ready amount of metal b metal um especially steel yeah present i mean dark sun dark sun had a whole set of rules about um about steel equivalent stuff for mm -hmm. for equipment um uh, a game a game called asunder has a similar thing where it's a fantasy setting where there is no metal right well, we don't we don't touch on that uh, because you know our big inspiration is Conan, mm -hmm. the movie, the riddle of steel. You know, we have to. <laughs> so it's like the Atreians are definitely masters of steel, and in fact, one of the ultimate goals of the campaign is to reforge one of the mythical steel weapons, the the axe called Throm, that was used to defeat the Sorcerer's Queen. So. Mm -hmm. That's not really a consideration yeah. for us, each, but... Each race has one of the fragments of Thrawn. Yep, each race has a fragment, and they're hidden throughout the land, kind of like pieces of the Triforce. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to have to go out and find them, you don't know where they are, eventually you'll stumble across them. Uh, but barbaric tribes like the Swiss Spear will use bone or petrified wood or some other source for their spears and their weapons. It's very barbaric, so that's mm -hmm. definitely a play. You know, for a lot of our monsters and our our barbaric outlanders and outriders, you know, we've got stats for bone weapons and things like that that are mm -hmm. certainly more savage. Yeah. And I I always I always encourage people to look outside the box when it comes to when it comes to weaponry, instead instead of instead of saying that they're armed with a long sword, um, say that they're armed with I don't know a kopesh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. One of the heroes of our uh, one of the five legendary heroes is the frog Vilki. He is a frost beer who is one of the amphibians I talked about, kind of based on frog from Chrono Trigger, mm -hmm. and he uses a kopesh as his main weapon. And there are no real official rules for that, so I had to homebrew that. I kind of looked on the internet for what other people had done. But, uh, yeah, that's going to be a life weapon that's going to have some kind of parry ability that only Vilki can use. He's a master in the Kopesh, actually. Mm -hmm. And when it comes... Now, as I, as I understand it... You guys are shoot. You guys are shooting for a, about um, 
two hundred pages for the, for the book. Yes. Oh. We're one hundred and forty pages done already. Yeah, so. we're 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 getting close to the end. Yeah. Um. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general ball ballpark on the calendar. Well, we've actually got that pretty much set in stone because our Kickstarter is saying June, and we're going to deliver by June. So we're probably going to finish the rest of this month and maybe part of April, like finishing the writing and then editing and uh, proofreading. Playtesting. Yeah, we're going to... I'm part of kind of a group of OSR type of like gamers who are into this type of stuff. Uh, and of course, you could be included too if you wanted to take a look, but... We're going to share that with some some real hardcore gamers to look over it, make sure everything looks good, uh, and then we're going to send it to print. We should be done by June. Uh, all right, and I, I'll certainly be looking forward to it. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Neil Dry, you have been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and anytime you guys sit, see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often well, say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. If I'm ever around you, uh, next round is on me, buddy. Yeah, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be doing all kinds of projects this year. We've yeah. got another Iris expansion already in the works. And for this, we haven't told anyone. Can we announce this tonight on your show? Go ahead. So our very next book after this is going to be Trevor Finn and his Merry Men, and it's going to be Robin Hood inspired, bard influenced, uh, folk tales of Iries. We're going to be back on the continent of Iries, but we're going to get deep, deep, deep into the 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 folk tales and legends that make the people of this like continent like who they are. Yeah, we're going to have a new bard subclass. That's going to be pretty interesting too. Yeah. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a whole party of cards. Imagine yeah. that. They'll actually but, uh, have... <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. They'll actually be they'll actually be useful. Right, yes, indeed. right, exactly. And after yeah. that, um, you know, I'm actually we're kicking around some ideas for a, a kaiju monster battle themed RPG. We're going to write the rules from the ground up. It's going to be a whole new project. So that's going to be a, a kind of a a deviation from the norm for us, but I feel like that's going to be pretty cool. So you're probably yeah. going to be digging around for a PS2 copy of War of the Monsters. <laughs> I have that. I already have it. No, just NES Rampage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> NES Rampage. King of the Monsters. We got it under control. And after that, we're, we're, we're working on our, our gothic city and our and our world in Iris, uh, Irulan. We've got a Shadows over Irulan, like a it's going to be like a Jack the Ripper style uh, murder mystery. And yeah. it takes place in our shadow city. That's gonna be cool. Uh, that'll be kind of neat. We we're I mean we we have new ideas like kind of every fucking day that we just like whatever kind of sticks is. But our big one next one is gonna be is Trevor Finn and his Merry Men, and uh, which is we we've, we've just we've just got so many cool ideas. I can't spoil anything, but like I think it's gonna be probably my favorite book that we've released. Mm-hmm. But with, the, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And I'm going to be looking forward to what co what comes down the road. And there will be plenty more uh, where that came from, as there always is here on the open yeah. bar of the internet. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.